this episode of The Silburn Show, the Solution-Oriented Summit, creating a platform for effective discourse, seeking solutions and impacting actions, tackling knife and gun crime in our community. Let it not be our legacy. With your host, Silburn Sidiel and Stefan Gislain. With Stephen Akinsanya on Court and Youths. There's also another aspect of um, the whole thing regarding knife and gun crime. There is the judicial process uh, where people actually go to court. And as a result of that, they have got to be defended because each person, guilty or not guilty, at the end of the day, they are presumed to be innocent. Am I correct? Yes. So therefore, I'm going to invite Mr. Stephen, Stephen Akinsani, who is a barrister, who is going to talk to us now about some of the intricacies and the issues that these young children go through. And I'm going to say young children. And I welcome Mr. Uh, Stephen Akinsanya. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Yeah. Stephen, how are you? Very well, Silbon. Well, bit uh, hot, but well. <laughs> hot, but well, yeah. Well, you know, we've got to try to bring a bit of Jamaica in the atmosphere. You've been to Jamaica, have you? Of course. You've been to Jamaica? Oh, yeah. Awesome, sure. awesome. <laughs> so, Stephen, um, this whole issue regarding um, youths and the judicial process, can you just explain that and some of the experiences that you have gone through? Um, we're live stream at the same time, so the key thing is that we've got this audience here, but we're reaching out to a wider community. Sure. Okay, thank you, sir. Well, actually, Silbon, the, um, the emotions are quite raw, and I say that because when we spoke last time, I was telling you about a case I had just finished, yes. um, a six-week murder trial at St. Albans Crown Court involving five young black teenagers who were all aged 15 years old, 14 at the age uh, when they were accused of murdering a young man from Waltham Cross. Uh, last Friday, at the Central Criminal Court, otherwise known as the Old Bailey, I had to go and deal with the sentence. And I was emotionally drained by the end of the day because it re reality dawned on me yet again and I've been doing this job for 25 years and I should say now that when I first started practicing I was regularly defending adults yeah. most of the people I now represent as clients are under the age of 20 yeah. and they are all young men charged with the most serious offense on the criminal calendar which is murder yeah. Yeah. and these young boys last week appeared at the Old Bailey for sentence, having been convicted by a jury uh, at St. Albans Crown Court unanimously in four hours. Wow. It's the fastest verdict for murder I have ever seen or been involved in in all of my practice. Mm -hmm. They appeared before a High Court judge, and I just want to paint the picture for people because often we read in the paper about what happens when someone gets stabbed, the police are involved, but no one actually talks about what happens in court. And I'm privileged to work in the environment that I do because I get to see the young boys on a daily basis, first of all, visiting them in prison on remand. I get to see these boys each day at court before the court session starts. I get to see them after the session starts. I get to see these young boys when they are downstairs in the cells awaiting the verdict by 12 people who don't even know them. And last Friday, my client, convicted of murder at 15, received a sentence of 14 years in prison. So that's almost as long as he's been alive. And what I took from that when I went downstairs, and I'll come back to what happened in court, but when I went downstairs for the first time, in this young boy's face, I saw fear. He realized there and then, after I told him, because originally he thought that he was only liable to the minimum term of 12 years for a young person, that 14 years not only meant that the judge had increased the sentence from the minimum, but that he would have to serve all of it. Not half of it, but all of it. And even at the 14 year point, it's the parole board who decide whether he is eligible for release. And I saw fear in this boy's eyes. Now, when, when you mentioned fear and, and when you check the background leading up to the crime, did these boys have or came across fearful? No. These boys were 
associated loosely to a gang, although they weren't official gang members, but they had embraced that lifestyle, the lifestyle of selling weed, smoking weed, trying to make small gains by selling 10 pound bags of weed, yes. and they enjoyed it because they were making money, as the previous speaker said. There was a thing of making money, protecting their postcode, and it was all fine until the reality of the criminal justice system entered their lives. And what these young boys don't understand is that once you enter the criminal justice system, charged with murder, you throw yourself at the mercy of the court, the police, the prosecution, and 12 people who don't even know you who are sworn to give evidence, or give verdicts rather, according to the evidence that they hear. In the courtroom, it's a surreal moment where less than 10 feet apart or more, you have the victim's mother sitting in court, listening to the facts of how her son died. And on the other side of the courtroom, you have the mothers of the five boys listening to the facts of the case and mitigation before their young ones are sentenced. I can't describe the atmosphere. But it's a surreal moment where these two families, where there are no winners, these lives are lost. And what the youngsters do not understand is that 14 years as a 15-year-old represents your formative years. They don't get to do their GCSEs in a normal environment. They don't get to do their exams. They don't get to go on Duke of Edinburgh schemes. They don't get to go on holiday. That's 14 birthdays, 14 Christmases. And one piece of mitigation by a fellow barrister colleague of mine summed it up when he said my lord this young man starts his sentence as a boy and finishes it as a man that's the reality of it and I don't think people actually understand the implications of what they're doing because for a split second of two minutes of making a decision to pull out that knife and to stab someone He's ruined his life. Now, it's interesting. Um, there's also this bit about joint enterprise. And therefore, you'll have some, uh, a, a bunch of boys being arrested. Yes. And could be in the wrong place at the wrong time. Give us an example of where joint enterprise has really if affected some boys' lives. Yeah. Well, this case encapsulates everything about the criminal justice system and the law on joint enterprise. The pathologist in the case was able to determine that the two stab wounds, or eight stab wounds in fact, that this young man received to his legs, only one of the stab wounds was fatal. That was a stab wound to the femoral artery. He determined that there were two knives present and they must have been wielded by at least two people, but there were five people charged. They were charged because the prosecution could prove that they were there. Now, those five boys, of the five, only two of them could have stabbed him and only one of them could have inflicted the fatal injury. But all five were charged with murder. Why? Because of the law of joint enterprise. Each is responsible for the actions and the behaviors of the other. And this was a classic case where one of them, arguably my client, who it was determined was the person who murdered him, was supported by others who either held or encouraged uh, him to stab the victim and therefore they were all guilty of murder and I'll tell you this Silborn when the verdict came back less than four hours one boy in particular who was supposed to be the guy who introduced the group to the victim who died screamed out when the jury said guilty of murder because he knew that he did not wield the knife but he was there as a result of that, he was... He was convicted of murder and is now doing 12 years in prison. Now, the, the question is this that many people will ask is, after they leave, okay, in your, in your case and your experience, after they have left prison, some of these boys, what tend to happen after? Do you see them coming back? Well, part of the work that I do also, apart from being a barrister, is mentoring. Yes. And uh, each young black boy that I meet in custody, I take it upon myself uh, contrary to perhaps what many of my uh, white counterparts would do, to offer mentorship to these young boys when they're released. Now, usually it goes one of two ways. 
young men uh, redeem themselves, uh, take part in all the rehabilitative processes that are available to them in, in prison, and they fix up their life and they change, and they never look back. But for some of the young men, who are obviously serving the longer sentences, they become entrenched in criminality. And what happens is they usually get released and they then receive short sentences which build up and they become institutionalized. That's very interesting. Um, anyone from the audience would like asking a question to Mr. Stephen Ekan Senior? One second. Um, I think this, this, this kind of joint enterprise is quite, is quite serious. A lot of parents know nothing about joint enterprise because they always say, oh, it wasn't my son that did, delivered the, 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 final, the final stab, whatever. Yes. Right? And I think the parents nowadays need, need to be educated about the joint enterprise. Yes. I remember years, probably about three, four years ago, they had the same thing down by Victoria Station yes. where a set of boys and one girl stabbed somebody and killed them. Now, these boys, no, these kids were A-level students. They weren't, what you call it, oh, I don't really care. These were like A-level students, went down there for a fight, for a punch-up, right? One person, one girl went and bought, bought the knife, one person delivered, that's a delivered a stab, and about what, 12? About 12 of them all got long sentences, and these are like A-level students. Yeah. So when people come to me and say, oh, well, these kids are whatever. No, they're not, right? Now, a lot of these parents will be crying because they say, well, my, my child went and did just for a punch up, for a laugh, and they end up spending, because now they're getting a minimum term, minimum 12, minimum 14, minimum 16. So they're not saying, yeah, like you said, they're not going to spend half of it. But something has to be done about this joint enterprise, right? Because a child must realize, the parents got to be educated to tell the child, look, if you're there, you might be found, found guilty of the, of the rest of them. So we need to educate the parents. And I'm a bit, I'm a bit disappointed that we've got a park full of people, right? We've got a park full of people here. And I would say 95% is, is, is black people. But they wouldn't come here because it's, it's not really whatever. But if something goes wrong with their son, they're the first one you see on TV crying, oh, there's nothing wrong with da 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 da. Right? And somehow we need to get the parents involved. And that is, to me, that is one of the, one of the when I used to do mentoring, one, that's one of the, the things, I could not get the parents involved, right? Most of them are, well, you know what I mean? I've got to watch EastEnders, I can't come to your meeting, literally, right? That parents has got, especially like um, school, parent evening, black parents, a lot of black parents don't attend parents evening, right? But let that child get in trouble. They come, they want to fight the teacher, and that's a fact of life, you know what I mean? So, we have to start. We have to start with the parents, right? And 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 the, and, and the guy uh, previously said, "Oh, let's 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 take back the, the, the postcode." How can we do that? <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> kind of going to take things back, right? And and as a black man, I actually disappoint with a lot of the parents. Seriously, disappoint a lot of the parents because it doesn't concern them unless there's something wrong with a child. And I've got loads of experience, I'm not going to bore anybody anymore, but I've got loads of experience with black parents, never see them until something goes wrong. And then they come to me, say, can you go and represent me? Why can't you represent yourself? Are you your child? You know, that's all I've got to say, really. Yeah. Well, can I thank oh, you? Thank you so much. Thank, thank you for your honesty. Um, because until we start addressing the real issues and we're not embarrassed or ashamed to confront the real issues, there will be no solution. And everything you've said, sir, is true. I'm a school governor in two schools, and they see the same issue. And, uh, you know, until people actually want to go out there and understand the criminal justice system, understand what it means to be joint enterprise, because you're right, it doesn't affect people, it's not my business, until it happens to you. And then you're the first one to start saying, well, my son didn't do it, what is this joint enterprise? We, I take it upon myself to go into schools, all the schools in South London, from primary school age, because that's where it starts, to try and educate the youngsters about what it means to be affiliated with a group, to walk with the wrong people. When something goes wrong, you are equally culpable for the friend who was carrying a knife. And I've done numerous murder cases over the last 10 years now, numerous, and all the issues are the same. 
joint enterprise. One stabber, usually boys walking around in a group, but you're all guilty. And I'll tell you, it's so bad now that old stuffy judges maybe people might call them but old bailey judges are so concerned at the sentences that they are having to pass by law on young black men that they themselves are going out to school they themselves are going out to school or holding seminars at the old bailey about the law of joint enterprise so how, what an embarrassment and an indictment that we have parents who couldn't give a damn or don't want to learn about joint enterprise or are not interested in what's happening in this school. I was so concerned that I even trained to become a chair of an exclusion panel for schools because I recognized that there was a theme running where young black boys who were involved in criminality were also the same boys who'd been excluded from schools. And I wanted to understand why are our boys being excluded from schools? Because one thing I'll tell you, a lot of the young black men that I've represented over 25 years, some of these boys are the brightest boys you'll ever meet. And it needs to stop. Because last Friday, last Friday in that courtroom, I was close to tears, even though I've been doing this job for so long, to watch five young black lives gone. 14 years in prison. I have a son of 14. And each day I go home to do my job, I look at them. I look at my sons and think, but for the grace of God, that could be my boys. But I'm involved and I'm relevant. And so I try and make it stop. So everything that you say, sir, is absolutely correct. Absolutely correct. Wow. Stephen, it's always a pleasure and a bit emotional to hear, you, to hear you talk. I believe as parents, you hear two people talking about the issue having some parental guidance. And it's important that we have home education, you know, the type of home education that will give our youngsters to understand the law. And what I've noticed for the past couple of years that we do not have this kind of education in our in our home systems. So what can we do to bring that cap that of awareness to be real in our communities? This is where now me and myself, me and Silburn, Paul McKenzie, we decide to take this summit further. What can we do to, in terms to bring up solutions? As you can see, many of the young black kids are being sentenced to 12 years, 14 years, as the barrister said. But now the problem is what can we do to reduce those kind of issues? And I think some of us parents who are here it's not just about listening to this, but taking this on board. And I would like to hear some couple of questions. Have you got a question to give? You got a question? Yeah? We would like to hear the questions, of course. Right. Um, thank you very much for your talk. It's very, very informative. Um, I've actually studied my degrees in criminology. That's about 20 years ago. Um, I initially wanted to um, work within the criminal justice system, but I opted out to do a, te do a teacher, be a teacher, sorry. Um, so I've been teaching for about 15 years now, and um, pri at primary level. But what I've noticed within the, um, the schools, as well as we say that parents um, are not there for the children, and parents are not turning up for parents even, and so on and so forth, the teachers themselves, or some of the teachers, are really struggling with the young children. And I'm not saying predominantly black or predominantly white, I'm talking about in general. And although most of the children teachers have a teaching degree, the teaching degree is out of a textbook. And learning or teaching those children real life skills and what it means to be a man and what it means to be, the teachers do not have those skills. Also, the parents are struggling to manage the children at home. And a lot of parents feel a bit, um, it's a bit of a um, taboo to mention it, to say, well, I need help. I need someone to come and help me with my son. You'll have single parent mothers who are struggling with their young black boys. And there's, no, there's not many organizations or they don't know of many organizations that they can go to to ask for help. So I'm, it's really nice that we've got this, um, this forum here to maybe to educate parents more, even to educate teachers who are struggling with children in their class. When I uh, take over a class in September, I let the children know that you are here with me for a year. 
and you spend more time with me in this school setting than you do with your parents. So you have no choice but to listen to me. I'm your parent within this school setting. So thank you very, very much for your, your, your information that you've given us. And it would be really nice for us to think of um, a way that we can start maybe training or teaching parents how to manage their young children growing up. Because you'll have, there was a young boy that I taught when he was in year three. And sadly, I think he was killed about three, four years ago. It was all on the news and everything in Hoxton. That boy was a dream pupil in school. There was no problems with him, but the minute he set out into the real world, into secondary, something went wrong. So thank you very much, and maybe somebody can enlighten us in another way. Stephen, if, Stephen, if you want to follow... Stephen, if you continue. Community education, a cooperative voluntary national service. Yeah. From 1960, let me tell you, I am one of the founder members for Lambert Country Show. The domino is there. We changed the domino club into Light Leon Community Center. Ask any one of them if they know what is the English flag. It's still fantastic. Fant well, well, as you, well, as you can see, a round of applause for the gentleman there. Well, well as you can see, it's a, it's a very. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Okay. 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 Well, Charles, thank you very much, sir. I'm um, Yisrael. Can you, Yisrael? Can we ask this gentleman to just um, thank you very much? Well, Stephen, does this are these are those things happening in court? You have outbursts like that? I'm used to it. I'm used. To, I mean. Look. <laughs> I'm used to, even last Friday when yes. the families were sentenced, the yes. fight developed between two mothers, one yes. mother blaming the other mother for her son yes. being convicted of murder. But the question was, where was she when her son was, was, was out there yes. committing offenses and also being part of a gang? And more importantly, when he was excluded from school, I saw the records. Where was she when all the meetings were called? Right. So, so therefore, and, and this is the reason why this is so important. Someone asked me today is... Uh, someone, want, sorry, excuse me, Stefan, can you control what's at the front there? Um, uh, someone said to me today, um, where are the youths for today? And I said, the youths are important, but the parents are also crucial to understand what is happening in their home. Today, later today, a young lady is going to be speaking about county lines and about social media and about how it's important for parents to understand Snapchat. People don't want to do Snapchat but, and talk about these things. So, Stephen, Stephen, what are you, would you say are some of the key um, nuggets that parents, people should look at in regards to pinpointing certain um, where they believe their children are going off rails? Um, principally, you have to know what your child is doing. It's not always easy to do, I understand that. But you have to take an active involvement the same way I chastise my own child. He wants to go somewhere. I want to know who, where, when. And I don't just allow them just to go off and do what they want to do. Yeah. We have to become more involved as parents. We also have to understand and make our children understand the value of education. Yes. Because it's all very well when you're making a little bit of what I call chicken change, selling weed. Yeah. But I've been involved in cases involving the people at the top end of the drugs line, the guys who live in Essex behind gated communities, yes. the big, big players. Our children are not that. They're the little boys running around the streets peddling drugs, risking their lives because of postcodes ending up dead. So we need to educate our children. We need to spend time with our children. We need to show them new experiences. There are social economic factors, uh, the, the loss of community centers. But one thing above all, we can we can argue with the government, we can blame the police, but we have to tackle this issue as a community ourselves. Yeah. And I remember you said this one time, you're in court, and, and I, I don't know if, you're hurt, if, if you said it today, when you said to the judge, look up there. Yes. Can you explain that? I don't know yes. if you said it earlier, but you can say it yes. again. Yes, I, a case that I did at Croydon Crown Court, and I looked to the public gallery, and again in this case, through a six week murder trial for five boys, black boys, and every day for six weeks, I would look in the public gallery. And across six weeks, 
the public gallery was filled with women. Croydon Crown Court filled with women. And as I mitigated for a young boy, this was a young boy who had a full scholarship to my son's school at Whitgift in Croydon. He had a full scholarship and he got himself involved in a gang. Aggravated burglary. And ag aggravated burglary of a home that belonged to a police officer of all people. He ended up getting eight years. And I said to the judge, and I looked out in the public gallery, and I said, look, Your Honor, herein lies the problem. On sentence day, there's not one man in the public gallery. Where are the men? Even if his father's not there, where's his uncle? Where, where are the men? Women shouldn't be raising boys on their own. Even if they're lone parents, they should have the support of strong men, uncles, fathers, because a boy needs a man to raise him. That's, that's, that's really powerful because... Uh Ladies and gentlemen, and on live streaming, we're going to have someone speaking today about what it is to be a father who's sitting in the audience now. So, so listen, um, just one more thing. Anyone have any burning question? One, or, one burning question for... Okay, we'll take two, yeah? Okay. Hi, my name's Darren Gregg. I'm a mentor. I've worked with Mighty Men of Valor, Prince, um, Prince's Trust, um, Boris Twit Johnson, Twat, yeah. Dave Cameron. I've done a lot of work. I did the program called Black Boys, which I was offended by in the first place, but I still entering, yeah? Now, my question is this. You said um, about the schools, how um, we're underrepresented with regards to like males being responsible for their children. Now, as a, as a father myself, um, when me and my, my um, daughter's mum became estranged, it was nearly impossible to see my child, yeah? Nearly impossible. Yeah. I have got a, a record, very small, um, one offence of drink drive and one offence of, I think it's petty theft, some kind of yeah. theft, yeah? Uh -huh. um, I was literally about 24 years, of, 24 years of age when it happened. Now, where you're saying that we're underrepresented, my question is this. Mm. As a man yeah. that's doing all he can to be there for his child, he's being labelled in so many different ways, what is the best way forward, one, and two, what support and advice is available for them? Thank you. It's a very good question you asked, Darren. Um, and, and can I say this? And I, you know, I'm, I don't, I'm not a politician, and I hate politics, and I, I, I echo your sentiments about uh, Johnson and Cameron, because I, I, that's another topic. But let me say something which may be controversial where two people are not always able to stay together. I've got a message for the young women. Don't cut the man off if you have a child with him, but don't use the child as a pawn in a game because the children grow up. They need to be mentored. They, uh, boys need their dads. And it's pointless, oh, that's mine. Yeah. It's pointless using the children as a pawn because the only person who suffers ultimately is the child. So it may be controversial me saying that, but I have to say it because I've seen it. And it does, I always tell people in this situation, don't forget, children don't stay children, they grow up. And where they are, perhaps hearing one side of a story, they'll be old enough one day to ask questions. So you do it to your own detriment. In answer to your question, sir, it's very difficult because the system is designed that if you have a criminal record, or, or even if it's years ago, that it's always designed to use that uh, as a stick to beat you with so that you are hampered in what you're trying to do for the best efforts of your child. I'm happy to speak to you after to see if there's something that I can do, but it's very, very difficult. Fantastic. I will take one more question from this lady. Yeah, just something quickly. Um, what, when you convict these boys and when they go down, what do they say would change their minds from taking the route that they've taken? What intervention, what are they missing out on? What, what would have changed their minds from what- Very good you know, question. What they would have a lot of these young men are taken in, and I know there's gonna be a talk about social media um, later on, but we as a community, and not just we as a community, but generally the world has a problem because we live in a multimedia age. And unless we're monitoring what our children are watching or what they, what they aspire to, they are so drawn by the love of quick money materialism and they don't value the things like working hard and building and an education 
And so until we address those issues, we're always going to have the problem. And certainly talking to the young men that I've talked to over the last 25 years, the one thing that they say to me is they wish they could firstly turn back the clock of time and secondly, secondly, that they had the courage and strength of their convictions and the support and mentorship of others to tell them that they're okay where they were at the time, that there was no need to join the gang or to want that extra bit of money, that to live for the here and now is not what it's about. Because ultimately, if you're making four or five hundred pounds a week dealing drugs, it's for a short season because you're either going to end up with your family visiting you in the crematorium or the grave or that you're going to end up incarcerated. It's short term. And until children start understanding that they need to build a legacy, build a future through education, through skills, through craft, or whatever the dreams that they had as youngsters, that they can achieve the things that they want through the gifts they're given, we're always going to have this problem. Well, Stephen, I want to thank you so much. Um, and ladies and gentlemen, and live streaming as well, uh, this is a very crucial aspect. This is an area whereby uh, it is not normally discussed. No. And uh, when you came to the first one that was discussed, I um, got lots of feedback about that. But it's good that you mentioned about where the fathers, because Mr. Charles Kieran is going to come shortly um, to talk about what is it to be a man? What is it to be a father? And Mr. Kieran is like also one of my mentors. But before I go to Mr. Kieran, I'm going to have uh, a Mr. Paul Johnson. But before that, ladies and gentlemen, let's give a round of applause to Mr. Stephen Akinsania. And uh, thank you very much, Stephen. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you so much for joining us on The Silver and Show. And uh, of course, what I'd like you to do is to like the videos, share the videos, and subscribe to the channel. Let people know about it. But important thing is also to comment. Let us get your comments, let us get your views, so we can understand how to even please you better, ladies and gentlemen. So, as I said, share, like, subscribe. Ah, thank you. I saw you there. You subscribed and you shared. Thank you so much. See you next time.